Hey, what's up? I'm Mike Squires, and this is Couchers Podcast, episode number 163, and my guest, Lisa Molinaro. Um, Lisa is... A, stop it. You're not a tough guy. Lisa is a very talented multi-instrumentalist who tours and plays in the band Modest Mouse. She's performed with The National. Um, she toured with uh, The Decemberists. She had a band called Talk Demonic. Uh, which is great two-piece band it's wild uh drums and a bunch of tracks and and like effects on a viola super like you never seen that lineup before right uh very cool band um cool lady i hope you enjoy this conversation we talked about a lot of stuff look at this dog good lord Mr. Big, how are you so cute? Huh? How are you so cute and so handsome? Mr. Big, who's the biggest dog? You know, this is this is how it goes sometimes. I hope you enjoy this uh, as much as I did because I had a great time talking with Lisa. If you're enjoying the couch, oh, don't, don't forget to go check out her uh, website, lisamolinaro.com. I'll put a link down in the uh, description of the podcast, all right? Um, if you're enjoying the podcast, please, please, please let me get what I want this time. Money. Support us at patreon.com slash couch riffs. That is the only place where you can download the audio from the cover song videos that uh, we publish. Um, and there are videos coming every week for the next two months. It's I shitload of work. You can't even imagine. And, uh, you know, there's not a team of people working on this. It's uh, it's me. So uh, I paid Don Gunn to mix the audio because I, I, you know, I'd ruin that. No doubt, I could ruin that easy. And it doesn't matter how good you are. I could ruin a mix. Um, Patreon.com. If if you are enjoying the podcast and the videos, and you are able, your your support is very, very, very much appreciated. Thank you. Also, you know, thanks to our friends at River City Guitars in Spokane, Washington, at River City Guitars on social media, rivercityguitars.com on the World Wide Web. Um, you know, you don't live in Spokane. That's all right. They got a website, right? Go check it out. Also, every day is a buying day over there. Every day is a buying day. So if you're sitting on some stuff, my guy Bobby probably may be interested if it's cool or vintage or, you know it's cool um give them a shout 509-818-7693 or shoot them an email sales.rivercityguitars at gmail.com tell them squire sent you we go way back he's a dear friend and uh, i wouldn't steer you wrong you could trust uh you know the uh by and large there aren't a lot of shifty people doing guitar business anymore you know there just aren't because the you know the internet flushed those people out but bobby is one of the one of the most upright folks i've ever met so support river city guitars all right don't forget the golden rule treat people the way you want to be treated and uh come here rosie don't forget that uh you know not to trust people who don't like dogs Yay. Please, can you hear me? Is connecting to audio. Can you hear me? I can you're very quiet. I can hear you. Okay, good. Hold on, um, I'll turn up. Oh, that's good. How about now? Testing. One, two. Oh. One yeah? look at cute little puppy back there. I know. I figured he was gonna try to bust through the door every five minutes so look my dogs usually make an appearance in every episode what's up hippie look at that little <laughs> hair we have the same hairdo we got matching look at i had it. to put mine away look. we literally have the, the same yeah, hair i've got the uh, grow out bob uh it's like if 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 Henry Rollins had his grow out phase during the like sweater wearing nineties, <laughs> like if, I really I really like it. 
it's working it's working for you even the in-between phase yeah for sure yeah that's a story of my life of my hair life how's it going it's pretty good what kind of fancy microphone is that a gold microphone <laughs> i figured why not i'm interviewed i'm being interviewed with mike squires i'm getting off the goldie it's my telefunken <laughs> it's uh it's is it a, is it a telefunken true they're telefunken wow look at that fancy thing it's very hip-hop of you 80 yes i'm a little tiny bit hip-hop yeah, i'm a, little, a lot punk rock i'm equal parts punk and hippie with a just splash of hip-hop <laughs> uh, uh, wait we're not taping that's all the good material no we're we're recording from the top. <laughs> yeah so don't talk shit about anyone that's what i, I uh, oh my gosh five I had minutes to, like, in i usually this. tell people like oh hey by the way I've been 30 minutes into a conversation and had someone say, are, are we, are we started? <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. That's great. Amazing. Yeah. That's a, I don't know if that's a testament to my lazy semi-professionalism or. Uh, I think it's, um, you know, maybe people who are, doing this they don't um maybe they don't do it a lot so it just feels very casual and oh well, to, yeah that's the point no really what's going on i it's guess to be casual mm -hmm. so for for people who are are watching and or listening i i'm trying to think i've known you for almost 20 i've been knowing you for almost 20 years mm -hmm. and we met at the fresh pot mm -hmm. cafe Mm -hmm. uh in north portland a coffee shop where you were I can't remember where we first met if it was north portland or the southeast but yep it was through fresh pot it's uh, probably north portland first because that's where i've worked a little bit more at the beginning yeah and i i was a coffee delivery person you were you yeah me more coffee mm -hmm. that's it and um i remember when you you were like oh i i play music Mm -hmm. And I don't think you were playing with anyone at the moment. No, we came super close to playing together. I'm not sure if we actually did, but we talked about it. I'm sure. Yeah. I talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I talked a lot back then. I was asking everybody to try to play with me. <laughs> uh, and I, I remember coming in one day and you were so stoked because you said, that either you were going to play with someone or you had just played with someone and you were in a band. And I was like, holy shit, that's amazing. Yeah. And that band was Talk Demonic. That's right. Was that your first band? It was my first band that I was legitimately a part of. I would, I sang some harmonies and played a little viola back in high school and college for friends of mine that were in punk bands and like, you know, their high school bands and stuff. Right. I was never part of the band until Talk to Monk. Mm -hmm. How exciting that was. Mm -hmm. That was pretty cool. Then you get in the van and drive around and you're like, oh, right. <laughs> no, uh, talk shit. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> i'm not supposed to talk shit no i mean at least you weren't in a five-piece band no we had like an e350 we were a two-piece and yeah. we did west coast stints by ourselves you guys we did tour national tours like with a, one friend and a tercel we did kevin used to tour out of his geo metro when he was so he's because he was talked to monic solo before me Right. And he used to just pack his kit in the back of his Geo Metro. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <amazing>. <laughs> <laughs> we did tour once with in a minivan, a rental. We were chasing a we were chasing a bus. We were doing support for Kurt Vile and Flaming Lips. And we had a rental van and it was it was a nightmare. It was fun. How did you guys get that tour? Yeah. How many gigs did you have? We had, I want to say we had five or six shows, maybe. That's Something amazing. like that. We were, it was a part of a tour. And then I, 
oh, Kevin is so much better with dates and, you know, details than I am. That's like the peak of Flaming Lips powers. Yeah, we were doing like, um, yeah, and it was right when Kurt was getting to be like, you know, pretty, like the Smoke Rings um, record that came out. Right. So he was still not as big as he is now, but he was still kind of getting there. And we were just the first of three. I don't know. How, I don't. We had uh, pretty good luck after touring with um, the national, you know. Right. I think. I don't yeah. know how we. I don't remember how we got that. We were very excited to get that. That was really fun. It was really Aaron fun, lived fun like three shows. miles away from me. Who? Aaron from the national. Oh. Oh, Desner? Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. three miles away. Yeah. His studio is cool. Did you go there? I never went to his studio. I've only been to... Uh, we toured a lot with them, and we stayed a night at Matt's parents' house on tour. You know, we had like a night day off somewhere in Ohio. And uh, we... Did we split up? It was a couple of the boys want they wanted to talk to Monic to spend the night at their house and we had to decide who. Right. <laughs> we ended up staying with Matt's parents. <laughs> no, I've never seen studios, just you know, living rooms and right. pools. <laughs> That's not so bad. Uh, -uh. uh how did you how do you end up playing viola? And also is it are you always bummed out when someone uh, calls it a violin? I'm not bummed out anymore. I used to be very like righteous about it and I would immediately correct. And sometimes I still do. And I just read it. You know, I just, when it doesn't, it never really matters, but sometimes I'll comment that's a viola and sometimes I just let it go. But um, I used to, I'd actually it's a viola. And then I do a little bit of education because <laughs> most people don't know what it is, you know? Right. They're like, Oh, what is that? Just a big violin. Kind of, I have to describe it like somewhere in between a violin and a cello. Right. And then they're like, oh, oh. like a violoncello. Yeah, I've never heard of that. I'm like, exactly. It's the instrument you'll never, you'll never hear, but you will notice when it's missing. Right. You know, and I became a violist because they needed violists in my, I went to a school that had a really excellent chamber orchestra program. So we started in seventh grade. And you kind of got to pick your instruments and you know, everyone goes to the violin, everyone else goes to the cello, you know, and he needed violists. He was like, better start volunteering before I start picking people. I'll do it. I kind of fell into it on accident. And did you and did you immediately fall in love with the viola or were you were you envious of what you were bookended by? Mm. I will never not want to be a cellist. Right. It's the supreme instrument to me in the string family. It's so it's pretty insane how cool it it is, right? It has a huge range. Right. You can it can sound like a cello, a viola, a violin. It's just got a the acoustical dimensions in a viola and a violin and a cello are technically perfect what is that and i just think um you know with acoustical acoustic science you know with the dimensions and the vibrations and everything like a, a violin mm -hmm. a perfect a proportion violin has very very good acoustics for the vibrational waves that come out of it in its pitch range right viola is like doesn't quite work that way so you get a lot of anomalies in like the in the timbre of a viola but no, I loved it. I loved how the viola was like very melancholic, you know? In the traditional, what would, like if there was, is that called a pit orchestra? If you had a, or a what is it called? A small, what is a small string section called? What is that called? Well, I mean, it's a string section. But if it was like three or four pieces, does it have a name? Is it called? Um, like a, you mean within an orchestra? Uh, like or just on its own? I mean, there's a quartet. Um, well, yeah, sure. That, that word works. I know. I figured you knew that. <laughs> was some fancy word. <laughs> anyway, this is terrible. I don't know. Maybe I'm hang on this. I can't be remember. I can't remember. You're like, I can't be remembering everything for you. Move on. 
<laughs> digging into my year, college days. Oh, I don't know. It was called, we were just called the string section. Right. You know, whether it was 13 or four people. What role does the viola take with those two instruments bookending you in the sonic? Well, I mean, it's support. It's like the inner voice. It's it's the it's the inside sound. So it's um, probably not always as tech. It's not as technically um, interesting. You know, sometimes we get a lot of whole notes. You know. Right. But you you need to fill in a sound. It's the violins doing something nutty over here, and cello and bass are locking in a rhythm. You know, it's like we are the internal support structure. We hold the inside voices that fill it in. Right. So it's a mid range instrument. So it plays mid tones between the highs and lows, which is otherwise you you know what I mean. You think about playing like a chord. If you don't have that third or that diminished fourth, like you can't get the real sound if you're just playing fifths or something. Right. So how does that translate when you play in the context of a rock band? Like what, what kind of a role do you take with that? Are you just sort of. It's totally different. I think. Right. First of all, having effects have been able, made me able to take, do anything, be anybody, you know, do you have a way even, I do have a whammy. I heard you talking about a whammy on the last podcast. <laughs> really? Yeah. You told, uh, is it Jade? You, oh, you yeah. were loving the lucky me and you said, Oh no, I almost I even got a whammy. It was like, Oh yeah. All right. You're going to have an audition and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but, and this record had whammy all over it. So I went out and bought a way, you know, I made no money. I went out and bought a whammy pedal, which was like the third biggest purchase of my life at that point. Not really, but my hairdresser gave me his whammy pedal he is an incredibly talented jazz guitarist and i had i hadn't had many pedals at that point i mean oh my gosh that might have been my first pedal he was like try this whammy and i was like what a whammy on a string instrument it doesn't it didn't lend well and he just told me to keep it so yes i do own one. Oh, you don't use it though i don't use it mm -mm. huh no that's that's funny to me i use all kinds of stuff but to touch right. back on what you said about what kind of role do you transition to right. in a rock band from playing orchestral stuff um filling it out with like octaves and other intervals can really just you can be your own little string section you know right and uh no in talk to monic i did not play a support role i was mostly a melodic lead you know right it's cool. It's cool to be able to like change it up. Interesting. But you, so you were into, I mean, when you get in your car on Friday night, you weren't putting on orchestra music and grown up, you were grew, grew up in Florida, right? I did do that. Actually. Yeah. But you did put on classical music when you go cruising. You could like some, go find the party Friday and you'd put on classical music. No, I'd put in like Econo Christ or right, that's... Uh, you know whatever I was listening to at the time <laughs> no I mean tape I had my tapes and stuff back in the day but um I definitely actively listened to classical music so you you were digesting punk rock and and classical music equally mm -hmm. that's totally. interesting mm -hmm. yeah I felt kind of split a lot of the time you know i had my one foot in each like world really right studying practicing immersing myself in the world of classical music and then i wasn't quite involved in music at that age in rock you know or punk or pop or whatever i wasn't really involved in that till after college but I was a spectator and I was like friends were in bands and stuff. And I got the same kind of, I got the same feeling from it as I did playing in an orchestra, right. listening to my favorite pieces and stuff. You never felt tempted to get a guitar or a bass and try to join a punk band? Yeah, this is like, 
uh, this is the one thing that if I don't end up doing, I'll regret, you know, when I go, that I didn't end up being that the good person holding the guitar or the bass. I got a bass for my senior year for Christmas, my senior year of high school. Oh, really? I got a, a Squire. I got like a, it's a cheap yeah. you know, Fender. And I played it a little bit through high school with a, a gal friend. I would go over to her house and we would just play guitar and bass. But um, yeah, I like, oh, I really wanted to be in a band badly. I just kind of ended up being really good friends with guys that were in bands. And I get, you know, and I would be really involved via them, you know? Sure but never quite made it my own thing. So it, go ahead. I was just saying like, I was really involved in orchestra at the time. Right. In school, I was extremely academic. I was really how how much academic outside academic. of orchestra rehearsal were you practicing your parts? And can you still sight read? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in college, I practiced a lot. I mean, just personal practice was probably three hours a day. Wow. And that was, it's not practicing what you're doing for cha chamber, which is a different ensemble, symphony, which was the big, the, the most important to me. What is chamber? Chamber is a smaller ensemble of, um, of musicians. How many? <laughs> Um, I don't know, 30? Oh, <laughs> something like that. Right. Then yeah, that wasn't the word I was looking for earlier. Okay. <laughs> no, it's like it's heavy, it's heavy on the strings, and right? Then there'll sometimes be other families of instruments. So, you went to school for music, mm -hmm. I didn't I, know that. yeah. I had a music ed degree for the first two years, I think, and then I swapped it out for something else. I kind of broke under pressure in college. I was playing so much. Was it like had, uh, in those movies where the kid is learning the piece on the piano and his hair frizzles out and at a what do you, what kinda, do you know? yeah <laughs> yeah think What's like pressure. Think dragging yourself to a practice room that's like probably four by eight and just playing until you can't play anymore i would turn the lights off and play because that was like the only way i feel like i could really get a little more involved you know right i was just playing a lot and playing the viola is um awkward and so i was in a lot of pain i was hurting it awkward much. because of the size mm -hmm. yeah yeah and if you kind of don't learn if you're not you can learn bad habits. They get ingrained. And I suppose I learned some bad habits for posture and holding and, ten, you know, held too much tension and had a very, I had a very rigorous teacher. She was from Latvia, my instruct, my private instructor. Mm -hmm. And she was old school, you know, I would cry and she would just tell me, stop crying and go exercise if you hurt. <laughs> I mm -hmm. remember she said that she's like, why don't you take up swimming if you're hurting? Really? Mm -hmm. Did you? No. Did you kick her? No, I I did not have a good relationship with her, and I I would say my <laughs> musical like <laughs> <laughs> my musical um my arc, you know, in college. Like I went, I, I, so I left for my third year of school. My junior year, I studied abroad. So when I came back, I was kind of like just cruising through senior year, doing really well with music yeah but i didn't really i wasn't a major anymore so i stopped having that kind of feeling of pressure you know no more okay. juries you know like, juries are like so stressful when you're playing in front of like a panel of professors before i ask you about your studies abroad what i know that just the physical position of playing violin and viola and the big violin, I mean, you're, you're crooked over. And so do you, have you sustained neck injuries or 
repetitive stress on your neck or shoulder? Mm -hmm. I have a torn uh, rotator cuff. I almost went That's in for like surgery. what happens to professional athletes. Yeah, but it's repetitive injury no matter what. I mean, repetitive use injury, you know? Right. Um, I've had just tendonitis, you know, problems with your forearms for a while. I moved around. So for a while, it was like forearm pain, mostly it's shoulder. I still have problems, you know, if you're playing and your, your bow arm is hooked up and over forward like this, you know, you're just constantly pulling on this, 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 all this support of your scapula. Right. And I, and I think I just wore it away, you know? Yeah. I, 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 it takes a lot of uh, unlearning, you know? to right. to not play with pain is maybe this is a naive question but in the context of orchestra you're everyone is seated and you you're in a in a very upright posture mm -hmm. and when you are in the context of playing with a rock band you're a little more you're standing you're a little more in the moment maybe you have to be up at a microphone are, are you more susceptible to injury in that context? Mm, I think so. Uh, particularly because I use pedals, my viola, and right. I'm having to look down a lot oh, to right. change pedals. And it depends on your um, attitude on stage performance. Let's say you're a little shy or, you know, you don't, you look down a lot. I was looking down and focused downward a lot to try to, you know, flip around, you know, flip a bunch of switches on my pedal board. And that will lead to just, you know, that, that sort of like hunched over kind of. Right. Yeah. It's a little worse. Sitting is easier for sure. This is a very rock dipshit question, but I just played. I just converted one of my bases to fretless, mm -hmm. but I, I mean, I have lines on my fretboard, you know, on the fingerboard there. So, and I still can't, you know, I still have terrible intonation. What was the learning curve like? And is it f more physical, uh, like muscle memory or is it visual at like, how do you how do you hone in on that or is it purely ear i could i mean ear is of course how you're gonna get all the way there but yeah obviously that plays a part and i would say it plays a part as the final thing in like right. less than a second in which you're you know placing and playing um definitely muscle memory definitely like how a feel when you're you know where it feels right to you and I never really look at my hands I don't need to look to find a note there's it's no weird point. when you pick up a new viola mm -hmm. like getting yeah. used to the intonation because the scale's all the same right yeah but the well the scale like the distance the right. actual scale yeah that's going to be different like i have two violas this one is the road viola and i have a nicer one tucked underneath and they are about an inch apart in size right this is a 15 and a half and i play a six i might actually play a 16 no it's a 16 and a half inch viola and the difference is huge it takes it takes a while to get back into the old must we'll call the old muscle memory set you know but i would get it it just takes a little crazy. while yeah so mm -hmm. it's not like you can have one on the rider when you show up in town you're traveling with one viola and be like yeah just send me down a backup oh i'm sure somebody does that <laughs> i mean but, is that a realistic option uh you mean having to switch to a different instrument well, like just like being or... able to, yeah, switching over in the, yeah. like in the middle of a show, like, oh, busted a string and in the heat of the moment, busted a string. I have this strange backup. I With think it's instruments. It's like, yeah, whatever. 
next different maybe um it doesn't take that long i think it's doable yeah yeah i mean if you have forced to make that transition during the middle of a song or you know on the spot in front of people it might not sound might not sound great right away it depends on then again that's just me you know i think it would take me a little while but i think it wouldn't take you as long as you think it's not a huge difference you know what i mean i wonder about like touring jazz bands like if a bass player doesn't tour with his upright and uses a backline bass in every town, like that must be crazy. I think it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I guess unless you're getting the same exact size instrument with the same right string height and all that stuff, it does seem crazy to me. So where did you go abroad when you went during college? studying in France for a year. How was that? Big turning point in my life. A really yeah. big one for me. I think uh, in terms of my inner development and maturity, you know, I think I was 18 when I, when I went. Mm -hmm. And I was, I brought the viola. I played a little bit over there. You were in college as young. I was. I graduated high school when I was 16. Really? Mm hmm Was I 16? I think so. Maybe 17. Were you a, a wonder kid? Uh, I mean, is skipping kindergarten wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> wonder wonder I cruised. I didn't even want to deal with kindergarten. I went straight to first grade. That's why. Good for so you. I'm like a year ahead in that sense. So yeah, I was a little younger. Right. But I switched to French as a major because I really loved it in high school. Those were the two things I did was French and music. French and music. So I was like, well, music is going to kill me if I keep doing it in college. Uh, I, my mom talked me out of dropping out of school and I flipped around majors for a while. It was like one different a week, you know, American studies, physics, like none of them stuck. And then I was like, well, I'll just do French because I know French really well and I'd love it. You picked around physics for a minute? Well, like um, astrophysics. I wanted to be uh, an astronomer. Like I, I wanted to be an astrophysicist. <laughs> <laughs> I totally wanted to be a rocket scientist. I love that. You and could have been I, working at NASA putting the thing on Mars. I know. And it's too bad. I got scared because I got like the first class that I had to take was like super hard. And I, I suddenly realized that's not what I wanted to do. Did but, you decide that you want to do that after you saw like Apollo 11 or whatever it was no that's, that's the kind of thing i would have decided <laughs> i just love i love staring at the sky you know at night we used to just hang around in florida on the top on the roof of our cars and like watch the stars you know right and, where in uh, florida uh, did you grow up i grew up in sarasota it's on the west coast is it's on the coast uh what is it? What else is it near? Tampa. It's near Tampa. South? About 50 miles south of Tampa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right on the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you like it? No. No. I mean, yes and no. You know, I got to a certain age where it got to be just like uh, suffocating to live right. in a place like that. There wasn't anything to do. There was nobody, you know, you got to a certain age, you had to be there. And then you were suddenly an adult. And um, I did move back home after college and stayed there for a little while and realized there's nothing for me here. You know, right. Just, it didn't have a lot of, um, I didn't feel it culturally, you know. Right. And say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just like hung out in beaches and parks, you know, like at night. Because yeah. there was nowhere to go, you know, until people started getting their own homes, you know, renting is like 20 somethings. And, and then I think people are like, what are we doing here? Let's go, let's go do something, you know? So I wanted to just get, I wanted to get away. Yeah. 
did you go straight to Portland? I did. Mm -hmm. Did you go there with a group of folks or by yourself? By myself. Mm -hmm. Nice. Did you know? Yeah. There? I knew two friends from high school that moved here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I came and visited. I checked. I wanted to, it was like DC, San Francisco, Boston, New York, Portland. Some of them were that 20 somethings would want to go in the nineties. Exactly. I right. really wanted to go to DC. The music scene there, the political atmosphere, everything was like, I really identified with, but Portland had like green trees and mountains. And, you know, I wanted to be somewhere totally different with that kind of uh, vibe. So I checked it out. It was really beautiful. And I was there the following winter, I think. I was here in July of 2001. And I think I arrived on November 4th of that year. That's a tough time of year to land in the Northwest if you are from a place that is typically warm and sunny. Yeah, I had a really hard time my first year. I was like, just your first year. <laughs> wow. I'm looking yeah. back optimistically. <laughs> my first get, like my first job, I got a job right when I landed and I little did I know that, you know, it was just like a vacuum for young kids was canvassing. Right. Door-to-door -door canvassing for some political organization or environmental organization. Yeah. And uh, I was stoked. I just landed. I got a job right away. I went to the Columbia store downtown and bought myself an extra large rain jacket because I thought that's what you needed, you know? Yeah. And uh, started knocking on doors like in December. It was my first like life, you know, in Portland. It was awful. Just How long did you last at that job? I tried. I quit very quickly. Yeah. Maybe a month in and they talked me into coming back. Really? Mm -hmm. With a raise? Uh, no. You're supposed to go out. They give you a pep talk and then they put you out there in a neighborhood and you have a clipboard, you know, and you know where you're supposed to go, what targets you're supposed to hit. And, and then you come back and give They're them like, stay them away from stats. the houses with the appliances in the yard. <laughs> you know, they actually said people are going to ask you to come in, you know, they're going to like, they like are kind to you and will offer you food or drink or something, you know, so just know that. I don't know if they ever said do or don't do that, but um, did they? somebody did offer me to offer to come in and I think they wanted to give me a hot dog. Can they, would you like a hot dog? Really? Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> I'm super good. <laughs> like, no, I don't think so. <sighs> nope. I quit. I went yeah. to a diner. I had no money, zero cash on me. I think I called my sister collect that night. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know? And then they just right. sat in a restaurant till my shift was over drinking water. And then they picked me up and they're like, how'd you do? I said, I didn't do anything this shift. I'm done. And they're like, Oh, you can do this. They pepped me back into coming back. So I worked another couple of months and then I rolled my ankle super hard. Um, coming out of a house one night like a very bad sprain and then I couldn't work for a while. So that ended it for me. Were you, were you living in Southeast at the time? Yes, I was. Yeah. I was living right off of Belmont and 15th. Man, those are the, that was, uh, those are the good days to live in Portland. You could get a room for 200 bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so jumped. I jumped straight to get in my own place. I found a studio apartment. It was delightful. I had a little recording studio in the closet. So sophisticated. I, I had to borrow money a few times from my parents. Studio apartment was six feet. To make it work. <laughs> it was. I think yeah. it was about that much. Right. What does a studio apartment go for now? Um, around 1300 between eleven and fourteen hundred dollars. That's a lot of cake for a studio apartment. I mean, kids don't think so, I guess, and people mm. with tech jobs don't think so. 
Yeah, those kinds of apartments are, there's a lot of new development here. I don't remember the last, last time you came to Portland. You probably saw I was some there of it. just over a year ago. Yeah, I mean, you've seen apartment buildings going up on all the main oh, it's uh, crazy. You know, roads. And those like are the ones. 75 coffee roasters in town. I can't keep up. I mean, it's I'm, I'm still a stump town girl, always. Right. It's it's crazy to me. I don't know. So you've seen not the full transition of Portland, but you've seen a lot of it because sure. it had already sort of started in 2001. I think it did. I feel like when I got here, I'm I felt like, oh, I missed I missed like the real best parts of living in the grit of Portland. I mean. Do you think, do you, you don't still feel that way though, right? No, because I made my own, my own history is, right. is, was um, awesome. What we had back then, the clubs, the music clubs, the places that are all gone now, you know, the shows that we saw and like the house shows and the just, you know, living in your twenties in Portland was even in 2001 was still cheap and right. just fun, you know? And there was always it. some cool speak in like after hours speakeasy action happening somewhere. And right? there probably still is, you know. But I think I do. I do think it's yeah. happening you know, in a Reddit in a subreddit though. <laughs> yeah. It's, like... <laughs> it's happening. It may have happened like once this past year. I don't know. I right. think. I'm not, I don't have my finger on that anymore, but I do feel like there's still like a punk rock scene here and a more of a, just like an undercurrent, you know, I'm right. sure there's stuff still going on in that realm where you can go see a show in the living room or who knows, maybe not right now, but yeah. So between 2001 and I think we met in 2003 or four. Yeah, I think you're right. What what did you do? You had this job that you hated. Mm -hmm. Were you you were actively pursuing finding music? Oh yeah, I was being like I was printing ads in the Mercury, multi instrumentalists and, looking for someone to jam with, and I did. I played with a, quite a lot of different people. And I did get a job in coffee. That was my first real job. I managed a little coffee shop, not fresh bought something before that down in downtown Portland. Yeah. And, um, I was working that job in the morning and then I would eat something downtown and then go to my second job, which was, I was like a front of house manager for a play at the Portland art museum. So I'd work from seven to three, managing this coffee shop, take a break from three to five, then right. go to the, go to the museum and run the, run the play every night or almost every night. I was working a lot. I was hustling and then trying to find people to play music with and figuring out what the viola was again, you know, outside of playing in ensembles, trying to figure out like. Recording on a four track in my closet, you know, playing lots of viola and like whatever crappy keyboard I had then and an acoustic guitar and singing, just like doing like folky kind of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were there any, were there any opportunities that came along where they were like, well, we'd rather, we'd like to have you play in the band, but can you, we don't need a vi viola, like bring your bring your squire bass and your keyboard and then that's going to be and I'll have my laptop because everyone had a laptop back then in their band right and uh you know and let's go no because I I think I was meeting with like-minded folks who were also looking for people to play with like single people you know one maybe two other people right and then I quickly met Kevin my bandmate yeah, you know, you know Kevin um, mm -hmm. O'Connor. I saw him play a show. We were it was at the Blackbird. 
and I saw him play a show. He was playing drums, and I mean, he's a fantastic drummer. I yeah. just went right, you know, I went right up to him after the show. I was like, you're a killer drummer. Here's my number. If you ever want to play music, it'd be fun. And he called me. And so, like, we started playing, I think, in 2004. So pretty oh. soon after, I was, like, searching around, and I kind of, like, found someone. And he wanted me to play viola. Yeah. So I was, like, kind of devoted to trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I collaborated with him more on other instruments. Right. Um, but that kind of, like, swept me in. At what point did you start? You said you had got a bass your senior year. So you, when you were 16, I keep forgetting, like, you graduated when you were 16. So you got a you got a bass when you were 16. Is keyboard theory a part of chamber theory study? Yes, we yeah, were required to do that in school. And I took piano lessons when I was a kid for six years. Right. Before so, viola. During viola. Wow. Piano was sixth grade to 12th grade. I had three sisters. And we lived on a modest income. My father is an auto mechanic. And my mom really wanted us all to have lessons. So she could we could afford an hour lesson and we split it between the four kids. So we had 15 minute lessons for, for a long while. We each had to like roll it in, roll it in next, next, next. Wow. Yeah. So that we all could have lessons. And then eventually I took over a little bit more. I can't remember if I ever got to an hour, but I was taking longer lessons and I was really good at piano. I, I auditioned for like a performing arts high school and I got in didn't go to that high school though i really regret not doing that really regret it but did you not go because it was dorky no all my friends were going you know oh i had a i had a pal who's uh oh, he's such a great bass player jason black he's in hot water music mm -hmm. and um george the drummer george rebello hot water music i grew up with those guys um and they both went to that school and they're extremely talented jazz musicians. They learn jazz. Right. And that was their like a uh, foundation. Why did and you, why did you end up not going there? It would have been a split day. You take part of your day at school. And then the second half, you kind of like bus over to the performing arts time. And right. I was like, uh, I just felt like nervous about that. I didn't, it seemed kind of, Mm, daunting to me right and uh i had other friends do it for like theater drama and stuff and yeah it's a big regret i wish i had done it, doesn't it. seem like you were making like you were timid in your decision making as a young person really but do you think that being a year younger or even like almost two years younger than some of your classmates do you think that that played any part in your decision to not do that? Because that probably would have messed me up. That probably would have been in intimidating to me. I was intimidated, but it's hard to say why. Why did I, I, I had, like I said, I was super focused on all things academic. Right. And at the time I was like competitive in foreign language. We were doing like state competitions and stuff. And I, perhaps I didn't want to lose focus on what else I had to do in school. Uh, I'm trying to think back, you know, I guess I would say like I was afraid. It's kind of, it's a crummy current that runs through my life. You know, I maybe make decisions or don't make decisions based on fear. It's a oh, lifelong that's, that's challenge, that's right? Does, yeah. Yeah. Let me so, ask you this side question. Mm. While you were in France, did you investigate what their version of NASA is? And was that when you decided you wanted to be a rocket scientist? No, I met a bunch of anarcho punks. <laughs> like, <laughs> totally just ingrained my life into this like anarchist collective in Dijon, France. They had a squat an old tannery that they turned into a squat performing space. Wow. They had like a little um, like headquarters where we had like meals. We made 
meals all the time and had talks and concerts. He just sat around and just smoked a ton of rolled cigarettes and talked about politics. I was so supercharged by all that stuff. Like I was very, very political and I made super good friends right. to this day. Great friends of mine, right. just being um, conscious of, of living and who, you know, what you do and how others do onto you, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. We're just really political and like punk, lots of punk music. And that was so, I was just all about it. You know? So no, I dropped science quickly. I didn't, I would never end science. <laughs> just stay with music. Yeah, there was a little bit of poli sci. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, little DIY poli sci. <laughs> uh Let's try and say that five times fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you asked me how France was. It was cool. I brought the viola. I played in some old churches in an ensemble. That was cool. I did a lot of traveling. I met really great people. I had yeah. my heart broken. Um, it was just, it was perfect. Perfect for an 18-year-old, you know? I, it mm. sounds perfect for an 18-year-old. Yeah, That's it came back totally different. Anyone, as long as you're your mind was in the right place. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, 18 year olds minds are typically all in the same place. Yeah. Yeah, I was, um, it was a, it was a good, really good year in my life. What do you think happens to us where our sense of adventure is just fucking squashed? I don't know. Being this age, I'm, I've been considering that, you know, um, right. I went on a couple of trips after that, you know, I went to France on my own after that, you know, and I still would, but yeah, I don't know if it's just the weight of adulthood and the obligations and the comfort. And I don't know. You're right though. I mean, I still definitely have the bug. I want to go, you know, I want to always want to go and travel. Right. And I think because you get to tour that kind of, you get it out of, you get it out of you a little bit, you know? Right. Mm, I don't know. It's a puzzle because I see it, you know, even in like my parents, um, I'd like for them to go see some places and I'm not sure they will, you know. Well, they're thinking about all kinds of stuff. They're thinking about the things that I'm only just starting to think about, right? Where you're like, oh shit, I'm, do I get to retire? Probably not. Right. I haven't really lived that kind of life. Right. What does that even mean? Right. Right. I don't know if I would want to retire. Do you want to retire? I don't want to fucking retire. What am I going to, what, what do you do when you retire? I mean, lately I've been lucky enough to be a toy musician. I don't even really feel like that's real work. <laughs> I mean, I, I do, but I'm lucky. I'm super you, lucky. You perform and you get paid for it. That's, that's, that's work. That's a career. Of course it is. Yeah. Uh, it's an atypical career. I can't do a nine to five. I, I just can't. Let me tell you, it's not underrated. <laughs> I mean, I, ha I guess I, if I have to at one point, I will, but you know, I'd rather not. So the idea of retiring is like, it just seems, seems like an amorphous transition into something else. I don't know what, but right. Um, Maybe like, I'll start working. <laughs> retirement is something you do if you have, like, if if you work for the county, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing that happens to me. I don't get anything at a certain right. age, except for maybe Social Arthritis. Security, if we get that. <laughs> Arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's, I'm not looking forward to anything. If I'd like to do the traveling now so that I can actually walk around a town all day or a countryside. Sure. Uh, when, when was your, well, I guess playing, going on tour with the Flaming Lips was, were those the biggest stages you had performed on up to that point? Yes. And what was that? What was that like? Because otherwise you were playing in Portland clubs and, and up and down the coast and smaller clubs. Those were at least theaters, right? If not bigger. Yeah. 
Yeah, they were about that. They were approximately that that size venues, bigger, definitely bigger. Um, it was it was different. Um, we had a friend, uh, an an LD, you know, this lighting designer develop moving images of like different, uh, but similar images to the cover of our last album, which was called Ruins. It's like a black and white piece of art. It looks like a little floating cloud castle kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that same artist has lots of other shapes like that. And so we had an LD, which we never had anything. We don't, you know, we didn't have that person on the road, but we had them develop like a backdrop for us, like a moving, glittering, slow projection. Right. And so we had that while we played and that was really exciting to me. I think it helped fill in the void of being the first of three bands. So, you know, nobody's there yet. Right. And they're haggling you and you can hear them. Right. <laughs> because there's not a clatter. Oh yeah. We played in on Halloween one night and I'll, I, they, so they were like, okay, a, a few people scattered about in costume. And I was like, you guys can get up if you want and have a good time, but you know, you don't have to. I was being like the nice, like, you can't say come closer because everyone's seated. Right. Like, en enjoy yourselves. And I could hear, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> you just kind of like did, you just like, you didn't put your head down. You just like, you did it. You walked on stage. It was big, you know, uh, but it was exciting, super exciting. I love playing on stages. Right. And having like the darkness and the glittering light stage behind you was helpful to pretend like you weren't on a humongous stage all the way down <laughs> in the front, you know, right. With like maybe a few dozen people. Right. Uh, do you, were there any shows of note, like standout shows on that tour where you were particularly happy when you walked off stage? Um, not, I mean, I, I feel were like- they all scattered audiences. We, play, like we were in Virginia and we played, maybe we played, was it the Norva? I can't remember. It was, uh, no, I would just say that shows where you just get a little bit of love back. That was just, that was awesome. And there were one or two where there were, people had filled in and, you know, they appreciated it. Right. Nobody knows what you're going to get when you see us play. When you used to see Talk to Monic play, it was just like, what is this? It's right. two people. <laughs> well, the sound is really big, but what are they playing? And like, what kind of style is this? You know, and people generally appreciated it, you know? Um, what happened to her violin? It's big. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look, look how big that violin is. She's tiny. She's hunched over the whole time with one leg, just kind of <laughs> like a chicken. I used to call it, my friends called it chicken foot. Cause I used to just take one leg and kind of wing it like this out to the side when I would play. <laughs> Cause I wanted to freak out. Like if I had a guitar, I'd probably be swinging around sliding on the, I just wanted to freak out playing. It'd be Michael J. Fox in it. But I had to, <laughs> I had to like, just, I had to control myself. I had a, like a delicate piece of wood as an instrument. I just realized that joke probably sounded really terrible, but it was actually a reference to Back to the Future. So if anyone took that the wrong way, I apologize. That is not what I mean. I immediately was like, oh, that was a bad move. I, I inferred that. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now when you get on stage, typically, uh, like not a lot of club shows like theater shows when you play with Modest Mouse typically not head or you're typically headlining or co-headlining or playing festivals which is also a headache do you love or hate festivals people feel the same different ways mm -hmm. um, yeah it's both I like playing a festival because generally our band is lucky enough to be at a point in the bill where either we're headlining or we're so close to that that down people are excited they're excited to see you 
they're there to see you or they're there to enjoy you right before someone else or whatnot. Right. So the, vi- the vibe is there. It sucks when you play a festival and people are not interested, you know, I don't need your love, but it would, it makes it fun. You know, I mean, you are up there and people are staring at you. Yeah. And- I had a bad, I wouldn't say bad festival experience, but we played in Philly. It was the, um, festival called it's the one that like um jay-z jay-z and beyonce put on oh i don't know usa festival wow you believe beyonce was the headliner what's that who was the headliner beyonce oh i've heard of her and we played right before her no (laughs) really (laughs) you know i was like okay uh i'm vomiting in the green tent under the tent because i'm so nervous really the the golf cart's right there and they're like you gotta go right now we gotta go you know there's no room for like lollygagging at a festival especially when you were vomiting from nervousness just from nerves yes i was a little nervous there were like 70 plus thousand people there that's a lot of being televised and i was that just made me nervous i'm not generally a nervous person on stage so i'm throwing up i'm throwing up I'm like, got to just, you know, zip it up and get some composure. Jumped on the golf cart, got on stage and played a fun show. Right. But, you know, nobody knew us. At least the first 30,000 people didn't know who we were, really. Right. And that was... 30,000 teenagers that were packed up to the front getting ready to see Beyonce. Sure. You're just used to it. You keep going no matter what. You know, it's not this, it's no different. You know that. It's no Was different. it uh, pre or post all the single ladies? Post. Post. Mm-hmm. That's a good song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, she was, it was an incredible performance. Did, did, and I get it, you know. Did mm-hmm. they have a clear, st- you know, at festivals, some bands want a clear stage, like nobody on the side. Was it like that or did you get to watch? Oh yeah, no, you can't be anywhere near that. Right. Not, not for her. I, didn't think so. <laughs> I was able to um, kind of, you know, wiggle my way into like a little bit of a VIP way, way off to the side. Right. Like I had, you know, you had to kind of really lean over to see her. You were watching the jumbotrons mostly. You would have had but a better you know, view if you would have got out in the crowd and got on someone's shoulders. Definitely. (laughs) (laughs) That's a weird bill. It was a weird bill. bill? I think Death Cab was also playing. So it was like peppered, uh, like pop and rock and indie a little bit with a lot of like hip hop and rap and like. Was there any metal? Different genres. I don't think so. (sighs) I don't know, but same similar story opening for Metallica at the Orion Music Festival. What? Yeah, Mouse got to do that. We played. It was like three days, right? Yeah, I think so. And we played just before them, similar situation. You know, nobody's really getting it, um, but it was still super fun. It was fun. Let me ask you this, because those guys curate Mm -hmm. that festival. Mm Mm-hmm. Which one of them picked Modest Mouse? Do you know? I don't. I feel maybe maybe it was Lars, but I can't recall. Right. Yeah. And we didn't get to, you know, we didn't meet yeah. anybody or anything. I heard them practicing in their trailer, which was cool. Did you play on the same day as Red Fang? Yes, we did. I wonder who picked- And I think that James went over there to watch them. So James may have picked them. I met James with Red Fang. And I have a great story and that I'll tell you not on camera, but it was one of the greatest moments of my life. And I think it, it really, it stuck with me hard. And every time I see the Red Fang guys, I remind them. And usually Aaron will be like, Hey, tell, tell that story again, because I can never tell it right. Cause he played an integral part of it. Mm-hmm. yeah i'll have to hear that story uh but he said something that could have like could have 
made our interaction with James go a little sideways. And instead it went swimmingly well. It was fucking brilliant. And so that's awesome. Uh yeah, he was a nice enough guy. But that's great. I like I don't love the um get on stage and hope that everything works and is in tune and all your settings are right, you know? Terrible. It only goes well two times out of ten you know no festivals just, suck you know where the best place to play is the show box that's a great spot mm-hmm. show box is the best venue i think i've ever played i think i saw last time i was there i saw uh drive like jehu and it was, oh, and right. it was so sick <laughs> i saw them uh just probably you know a week before you Mm-hmm. in brooklyn mm-hmm. did you think that that was just never going to happen again back then i thought that was probably never going to happen yeah but then you know it's happening more and more i was so excited we bought our tickets so far in advance you know i mean as soon as we possibly could and we heard about it but right. yeah that was a real treat yes i, I think in that band in particular i did not think that was going to happen because they've done all this stuff after, you know, like hot snakes and even whatever it's obits and stuff. Like they've they've got things going on, you know. Yeah, yeah. but to to get back and and play their old stuff it was thrilling. I loved it so much. Mm-hmm. It was great. Um, <laughs> I can't I still can't believe you guys opened for Metallica. <laughs> That's fucking great. That's rich. I'm so happy to have to have that as my, you know, one of my lifetime memories to have open for them. And the, the event, you know, we, we walked around that day. I met Jim Brewer that day. Nice. I was so <laughs> stoked. <laughs> <laughs> my dad is a really good goat boy. So like, he's super <laughs> important to me. <laughs> I got my photo taken with Jim Brewer. We walked around. There's like classic car displays there. So we went and looked at all these cool i love old cars and we went and checked out all these old cars and then got to play it was like it's amazing it's was amazing. a writing festival in chicago or something like that it was what? in new jersey oh it was yes maybe How, why do you have any idea why they picked new jersey Mm-mm. what were the other oddball bands because i i mean that's another problem with festivals i don't yeah. often look Maybe the last couple of years I have been looking because I, I will check other bands out if you have an opportunity to, you know? Yeah. All I, all I knew is that Red Fang was also playing. That was exciting, but they were playing kind of right before us, so we didn't get to see them. Right. Yeah. They did. Oh, on another stage. Exactly. Right. Did you guys play on the same stage as Metallica? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and... They have a quiet stage, right? I watched them from side of stage and they, they're they not using cabs anymore. They have a couple cabs underneath the bass, uh, underneath the drum riser, but they've got a whole thing happening now. I bet they did. I felt like we had a lot of real estate on the stage. Oh, you did? I think so. Yeah. And then it directly in front of us was an entire VIP section that was empty. Empty. I remember looking at one dude was on his phone. It's like a <laughs> smattering of people there. And the guy was on his phone looking down. It was the um, hyper, the, the well-to-do Metallica fans that couldn't afford the $500 ticket. Yeah. Or maybe they had them. Maybe that was a section that they possibly had them in a different like party zone before they could be corralled to the front, you know, before they play. I don't remember. Shaking hands with Metallica before. Yeah. I I, I went once to see them at uh, CenturyLink. Was it CenturyLink uh, Field or whatever in Seattle? I saw them on their worldwide. (laughs) Come on, Elmer. Well, I don't remember the name of the tour, but it's worldwide something. (laughs) Anyway, 
you know, uh, we were lucky to get some like better access tickets. Yeah. And so we were able to go to some sort of friends and family room, which is just, it was just four walls. Nobody was there. Nobody important. It was just other people that, you know, didn't actually know Metallica. (laughs) Grab all the cupcake you can eat. There's one for each of you with an M on it. That you had to pay for. Yeah. Uh, do you ever think like being on stage some like it's always the best when you are not thinking and you're just in the moment and you're playing the music but you know we're you're not always that fortunate right for whatever reason many different reasons it could be like could have been your day could have been like oh the air conditioning and the bus was broken and we had to drive here all the way from toledo in july with no air conditioning that shit happens Mm -hmm. uh or it could just be that like you're playing you know a piece of music that is not you know, a a hard and fast, like there's no solid arrangement. So you're taking cues. So you're not able to like fully let go. Uh, But when you're in those moments, do you, are you ever, do you ever have a realization where you're like, this is what, this is what I always wanted to do? Or do you ever, do you ever see your 16 year old self in the face of a kid in the crowd Mm -hmm. yes for sure i would say my involvement with modest mouse is a little more to the latter of what you were describing like i take i play parts you know i am not a guitarist or a drummer that's sort of just playing constantly right where you don't you know, you can think about what you're playing. I'm sure you can also play and think about like, when are you going to be able to do laundry? You know, <laughs> something like that, you know, is a serious concern on the road. It is. Uh, but yeah, so I have, I'll have kind of extended moments of not playing or playing maybe a, even a simple part, you know, that leads me into like a wandering mind. And I have struggled with that. And in fact, um you know like there's a struggle with um being able to be in the moment you know and i used to you know i would have a couple glasses of wine before a show and um that helped you know just kind of calm my nerves and i try not to do that now because it's just not a really good habit for me to get into i don't think it's very healthy um and but then you're kind of just you're very much thinking about, you know, what's going on around you. Right. And it does help to look out at the audience. To me, it does. I try not to look too long because I'll start staring. <laughs> I'll start staring at people. <laughs> They'll be like, why is this broad staring at me? <laughs> right. <laughs> Definitely checking out the front row. <laughs> and I love when I, I mean, the front row is usually younger people. Right. A lot of times it is, and sometimes they're kids, and I just love it. That makes me feel so good when I see a young kid, and even a young girl. You know, I'm like, maybe they're seeing me. I know it's cheesy, but maybe they're looking at me, going like, "This, this girl is doing this. I want to do this." You know, I'd love to be that kind of inspiration to someone. Yeah. So, of course. yeah, I love look. I love looking at the kids in the audience. You know who does that? John Reese. We're talking about Drive Like Jehu. Yeah. We saw the last concert I saw when COVID shut us all down. So what was your last show, by the way? Do you remember your last live show? Yeah. Yeah. Tweezel Zap. I probably have my, I used to have my ticket here on my, oh, it's right here. Hmm. Zappa plays Zappa, March 11. Yeah. Oh, you got in a little after me. My last, yep. Art Theater. My last show was Hot Snakes at the Doug Fur in Portland on March 6th. Wow. World-class uh, crowd stare-downs. 
I love it so much. Yeah, he's playing and he's right there in front of you, just looking at you, just looking. One of my just, life regrets is that I never saw uh, Rocket from the Crypt. Did I'm you? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Tell me. I did. So there's only a couple bands I will fly around the country to go see. And Rocket's one of them. Yeah. Tom Waits is the other. Yeah. Is there another? Not yet. Unless yeah. I think of one. But I def I've always thought that. I haven't seen Tom Waits. I would fly to a city to see him. And then Rocket would be just like with a girlfriend. Let's go see Rocket. Let's fuck it. Let's get a tattoo somewhere that day. <laughs> Let's get the tattoo and go He's see tattoo. it. Let's go get that Rocket tattoo and go see Rocket. Let's do the thing, you know? Um, but no, I saw them at the Paps Music Festival here in Portland on the waterfront. When was that? Mm, maybe six years ago, something like that. Somewhere around there. I don't have a good memory for Not that. Kind that of thing. long ago. I, yeah, I don't have a good memory for that. So I might be like way off, might be 10 years ago. Rocket played but, a show six years ago. Yeah. And I was like a pogo stick. Right. Just doing, doing, just bouncing, jumping up and down. I was so excited. I think I had seen them once before, but I was like, just, you know, the thrill of being able to see them again. And they have that. How's he feel good? <laughs> hype man. That, they got the hype man. Oh yeah. He's such, and I'm from Florida. And when he said that in his song, the song's about Florida. I was like, <laughs> you're like, wait a minute. Is it? Wait, and then I was like, wait, sh or? that's not right. Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Florida, man. Um, <laughs> have you, you set up a, a website this year? Mm -hmm. Have you been working? Tell me about the music you've been working on. I know you've been doing some stuff. Have you been committing any of it to re recordings? and uh i've committed some well i'm doing some recording at home you know i'm trying to make my own um we'll call them demos i guess and i'm i've done enough that i can kind of take a step back and look at them all and be like is this a cohesive body of work can i actually put something out i would like just I need to do that. I need to put something out. I've contributed to people's stuff. I've been a part of people's stuff. You know, I've been um, a significant part of you know one thing for a while. And but I just really want to put. My, I want to do my own thing. So I've been working, working on it. Yep. Mm, I don't know. Right. I need. Um, I don't know what I need. It's like a maybe a producer or somebody to come and help me. Yeah flesh out some of the stuff or give me a little direction i'm not quite sure yet are they That's, are they songs or is it music yeah so yeah. i kind of have i'm like forked i do two things the one is the songs where i'll play and sing and then the other stuff is uh composition like i did a residency a little while ago and started developing a string quartet. And so that's another thing I'm working on right now. And I've got two movements. I not movement. quite yet complete. Yeah. What's that? I'm, <laughs> on a, I'm on a crazy diet. <laughs> You've had two, two movements just today. Done. <laughs> Probably have another one. It's really a crazy diet. Oh man. I can't it's believe it. We did diet. it. We not couldn't get, we didn't get through it without talking about poop. I forgot to tell you that I do that before every show. Okay. Good. It's comfortable now. I'm sorry. That was terrible. <laughs> Two movements. Movement one. Well, each movement's like right now, only a few minutes long. I don't care. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to make 30 minutes of music as my first like string composition. I've written bits, you know? I'm really good at bits. I should probably do like syncing for commercials and stuff because I'm just great at like a 90 second thing. Too long. Too long, right? Too long. 
Thank they don't you. want that's not going to work i've on, always wanted to be that. told that yeah <laughs> my music's never long enough so i'm working on the string stuff and that's like an it's a learning it's definitely a learning curve for me because i haven't really like notated before hand notation is like no i can't do that so i'm learning are you using software i just started using logic pro yeah and i'm just learning it so you know, I was using Pro Tools to do recording, but not any of the classical stuff. I had Finale for that. And then I took a long break and now I'm just trying to figure out how to compose in real time and have it notate, you know? Right. It's not easy yet. I wrote a string section for a song once mm -hmm. and I thought, and I, and I use Logic, mm -hmm. you know? And I thought, this is great. It, you know, it'll allow you to print out what you've composed in the right. map there, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And I was just like, oh, this is great. I'm going to take this to the se session. And these folks are going to be really impressed. And they were like, this doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, we play in different registers yeah it's like yeah well, those uh the low notes right there those are the ones for you yeah so they did so they were good and mm -hmm. they fixed fix it up mm -hmm. i'm a dipshit what do i know no it's like i have to be mindful of that when i'm writing um let's say i'm writing the cello part you know i can eke out some notes personally on a cello but i can't like i have to remember what kind of and I'm lucky because I play strings. I can know what a string player can do. Do you, you have a play? I don't. Mm -mm. No, I was looking at ones for a while and then I just never really, never really got one. Yeah. But yeah, you got to know what they're capable of, you know, right. jumping around or playing notes together or even like your highest and lowest capacity, you know, pitch capacity. Do you have one of those fancy, like, uh, electric violins that's like looks space age, looks like it would be in Buck Rogers or something? Do you think I have one of those? Look, I don't know. Like, I a, know, I, can't tell, right? Like a silent one, you know, like, right? It, that's the Yamaha the came out with that. They had a silent one. It's a tool. I'm just saying. I have always wanted one. And just honestly, for like practical purposes, when you're playing, like we played a show in Vail last, right before, uh, in end of 2019. Yeah. Uh, outdoors. And it had, it was, so it was, for, you know, it was Vail in the winter. It was super duper cold and snowing. And then the heat on stage. I mean, the temperature changes were driving this thing bananas up and down, you know, slipping right. strings and, and then the snow, the, they had heaters on stage. So it was melting the snow on the tent cover and it was just, fall, just raining all over my equipment. Yeah. I would have liked a, something elect, you know, not uh, this. Rapid or something, something that's not a hollow, you know, acoustic instrument. Exactly. Surely so, someone makes some kind of crazy, you know. They do, but none of them sound good to me, you know? They just don't have the kind of sound that a, a hollowed out instrument can capture. So there was a there was a moment where I almost picked up a a carbon fiber viola. I tried them out. I went to the I went to the guy's house who made them. It was so cool. Wow. This is Clark, it was Clark Lewis is the name of the instruments. And they make top-notch carbon fiber uh string instruments all four you know the violin viola cello three violin viola cello um beautiful they're black I mean, all black which is like so cool to me you know yeah all, all black lightweight loud very loud and they resonate because they are acoustic yeah they're, they're acoustic you could put a pickup on them like you would like this instrument and Don't but you can also put it out in the 100 degree sun sitting on a stage and nothing will change right you can play it in the rain yeah it came close they're pricey right so i wasn't ready to, i wasn't ready to jump on it four thousand how much does a viola cost is that a tacky question 
No, not at all. When I got my first, let's call it real viola, you know, it's not real, but you know, uh, the, the, at the quality for playing, uh, I emptied my savings account in order to do it. My dad, I told my dad, he was like, are you nuts? Like, you don't understand the world of instruments in this realm. I think I bought my first one for um, maybe a thousand. Yeah. uh, With the bow and the case and everything. And then from there, I went to a 3000 and then a four. And then, you know, I've gone up since then. But um, uh, this was built by uh, my dear friend, Maureen Pandos. She lives in Portland. She's a luthier. And uh, this is an affordable instrument, totally affordable. And it plays great, you know, partially because um, it was set up well. And also, like, I like w- how it sounds with effects and stuff. Yeah. But you can get upwards of, you know, obviously, you know how high sure. fancy, fancy instruments can cost. Well, hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah. Of thousands. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's what I meant. Not hundreds, hundred dollars. Yeah, hundreds, hundreds. The string shop here in town, I think they have low range instruments that can start. I'm not exactly sure. I want to say maybe, maybe seven hundred and up or something. It's a good starting point for anybody. You can also just go to trade up and get one, right? And just play it for a hundred you- bucks. Have you given any instruction before? No, I've never taught. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. You don't care about teaching viola? That's not true. I would be interested potentially in teaching. It's one of those things where you're like, will I ever be able to teach if I'm still a student? Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I teach that- piano. I teach piano to young kids. You know, that's what you're thinking when you're sitting on the hood of the car looking at the stars in Florida, though. Like... <laughs> <laughs> i'm always yeah always doing that uh i would like to do that maybe someday yeah it's i don't know if i'm um got enough of what it takes to teach the string instrument you know i teach viola i teach piano to kids you're that's not, really fun you're not mean enough <laughs> i learned i learned from i learned from my personal experience yeah don't be mean <laughs> Uh, was that your last performance in Vail? Last performance was in Aspen at the Belly Up. Oh, that was cool. Was that, that a was show? Hmm? Was that a, that was a good show? That was a great show. Are you? Do so you know how small that, that stage is? So small. So, for listeners out there, Modest Mouse is now an eight piece. You know. Right. And uh, a lot of us play multiple instruments, so it was crazy. It was a really small show, really small show, really small stage, really, really fun. People are How right much there, the right there. How much was taken up by Isaac's pedal board? Uh, not as much as you'd think. I remember uh, getting a, a stage tour when I came mm-hmm. to see you guys up in Albany. Yeah. And I was very impressed by his dedication to the effects. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he, he does some really cool stuff with that. I think it's been since you saw that in our last show, it's kind of gone scaled down a little bit, you know, and a little bit and a little bit. He's simplified a bit, but still, yeah. Lots of effects. Fun, really fun. He's always, uh, I've always been super impressed with his guitar playing from the very, very, very beginning. He was doing mm-hmm. interesting things, even when he was not being put, like melodic, like his, the choices that he was making just with being sonic and making sounds was, you know. Yeah, I think that comes a lot from people who, like other musicians who, learn how to play on their own you know 
and they've never really not necessarily all the time but yeah and they're trying to just figure it out on their own I was just talking to someone a friend who interviewed uh some famous guitarists and they revealed that they didn't know how to play they didn't know what a, a scale a mix of midi and scale was or how to play certain chords right you know i guess that's sometimes that's why people become they stick out you know oh i think that the yeah. more even though it's easier to get obtain knowledge and this isn't obviously this is not restricted to only music this yeah. is uh, generally speaking in the information age when it's you know like a, a rock music is you know it's dumb but it's also <laughs> the best i agree yeah <laughs> it's it, like it's it's dumb it's not smart it's not orchestra music but there are you know there are things that you have to do that i think from playing in school band i learned a lot of lessons mm -hmm. and i imagine like like fighting for the first chair mm -hmm. talked about this that was something that i learned and if you want a gig, you you better be, you got to be better than the person you're, that also wants it, like right. anyone else that wants it. You yeah. have to be the most well suited for it, right? But uh, also existing within the context of a bunch of other musicians, now that Modest Mas is an eight piece, eight people on stage is there's a lot of room for chaos. Yeah. Uh, do you think that your orchestra experience informs you? Do you think that serves you well in this case? No. No? I, think. <laughs> <laughs> I keep moving around and the cushion on my thing sounds like I'm tooting. So if you hear tooty sounds, it's just the vinyl on the chair <laughs> on the dog and the dog is growling too. At nothing. Right? There's nothing on the other side of that he's door. Well, maybe your, he's growling at your farts. Yeah. He gets angry when I toot and maybe the cat is on the other side of the door. So, um, yeah, no, it's funny, like being in the orchestra and learning classical music and, you know, all that stuff, like there's some disadvantages to it. I was just like coloring in the lines all the time. So first learning how to play with other people, they're like, oh, just jam on this part. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know how to jam, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like I know what the theory is of, of like music, but like just being able to like free form play, what, you know, I've gotten better at that obviously, but um, that and also like, oh, we need to practice. We need to rehearse, you know? When are we going to rehearse? We should do this 10 times to get it right. And then we can move on. Like that's <gasps> so ingrained in me that right. uh, the rock and roll style of playing, I had to get used to, you know? Right. I had to get used to being able to, damn, oh my gosh. <laughs> Come on, Sammy. Sammy, you want to go outside? Maybe I should let him out. Go ahead if you want. Uh, we'll see if he calms down. Um, yeah, it was ingrained in me, that discipline and that served me well, you know, but also yeah. I need to just chill sometimes I need to just chill and know that like, I don't, you don't need to learn. You don't need to run that part 10 times with the whole band in order for everyone to get it right. You're not responsible for that. Here's the thing. I'm the person that always wants to over rehearse also. Like I want to be. I just want to walk on stage with 110% confidence. And I not do too. just in my part, like in all of the parts. Mm -hmm. Because if someone makes a mistake, it's not the end of the world. But if I hear it, it might get in my head. And that's on me, not them. But yeah, I, I do too. 
And, but I have learned to understand that, um, that's kind of what's can be what's so great about going to a rock show is just that it's very organic, you know, oh, we are, we don't play the same set list twice. We don't rehearse. Well, nothing is synced to anything, you know, <clears throat> there's nothing like locked into a meter or there's no you know, computer going on, on a screen. Line, right. Yeah. No, like, I mean, the way we choose songs is based on, well, Jim, our guitarist, every night will sit down and I think maybe I've told you this, we'll sit down and figure out when did we last play in Louisville? What was the set list? Print it out for me. What have we learned since then? You know, let's not repeat too much, but let's play something we did in soundcheck so we can, you know, and also <laughs> that we, not too many from this album, you know, and, and then it gets reviewed and voted, you know, sort of edited and voted by not only Isaac, but everyone else. But then there's audibles live, yeah? What's that? There are audibles live. Isaac, will, uh, will Isaac ever yes. call a song out live? Yes, all She's the time. Be on your yeah. Also. yeah, he'll look and realize I don't want to play that, you know, and then pick something else. And then the encore that happens is also like we all go outside or wherever anyone wants to go after the, you know, the main part of the show and discuss it. What do you guys want to play? What do you want to play? You know? Right. It's cool. It's, I like that. Seems normal, but I think a lot of times it might not be. It might be a much more programmed experience. Yeah. Almost every band I've, I mean, I've never played a show without having a set list that mm -hmm. was, have you guys done a show without any set list at all where Isaac just mm -hmm. called out songs? I don't think so. No. Mm -mm. There are bands that do that. Mm -hmm. And I get the, the only time I can think of, no, we probably built something. We flew to England to play a festival and our gear did not arrive. None of it. And not even so, the pencils or the, to write the set list. <laughs> not even the notebook and pencils to be able to do that set list. So yeah, we were scrambling that day to find a guitar shops, borrowing, you know. So I think on the fly, we had to come up with a set list that would work with the, yeah, what we yeah. had. I didn't have anything. I was literally singing my viola parts in a microphone and clapping a lot <laughs> really <laughs> yeah. how'd that go did you enjoy I, it? it's just like what's that did you enjoy it um it was it was that nervous excitement where you're just like just f it you know like this is what we're doing and, right you know we kind of briefly explained what was happening you know like why we were why it was the way it was and, you know, they seemed to just absorb it and they didn't care and enjoyed it, you know? So. I hope I just got a Parker fly. What kind of guitar did he get? Oh, I don't remember. I, he borrowed, I think he borrowed some stuff. Yeah. I can't remember. It was like, and it was a festival. So it wasn't like, we weren't even there until right before you played, you know? Oh, that's awful. It was go on. And I was sort of just come ooing and awing parts you know was it a one show fly-in or did you guys were you guys traveling mm -hmm. then to we were traveling yeah we did like i think it was maybe 10 days or two weeks or something when did your gear catch up mm, i think like the next day before the next festival before the next yeah before the next show That's good yeah we got our gear it just didn't show up in time for that <laughs> have you seen any youtube footage of you ooing and clapping no have you i I'm, will not look it up <laughs> look for it when was it i'm not <laughs> telling you <laughs> no i want to see isaac playing like a squire telecaster and you ooing and awing and like uh uh, you know, like some, some djembes, like just a, one of those, a cajon and a tambourine, like whatever you guys could. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave that. That's your challenge. You find it and let me know if you find it. 
It's like the Modest Mouse coffee shop set. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, I think it all falls into place with such a big band. There's still enough. There's like, you know, I think it all falls into place. We have, you know, we had somebody playing extra, you know, you know, Davey playing yeah. more uh, drums and also percussive and triggering sounds and such. And then Benny playing mostly like atmospheric and ambient percussive sounds which was really cool yeah yeah made it work oh davy mm -hmm. we love davy yeah davy's good uh have you guys do you guys have shows that booked that have keep get getting pushed back or do you guys have nothing on the calendar um there is a festival that's just been um announced in oh. vegas the life is beautiful festival in september so um that is the one show that's been announced so based on that knowledge it would appear that you know we'll be out there around that time is it the holiday weekend the long holiday weekend whatever uh, uh, memorial day or labor day no it's after that it's like the middle of the month yeah, I think it's right in the middle of the month. Mm -hmm. Huh. So, I mean, as long as everything goes well, the you know, globally speaking, uh, we'll be hitting the road at some point in the end of the latter half of the year. Globally <laughs> speaking. <laughs> yeah, I meant the metaphorically global. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't look like you, we're gonna. You go can to always play in Texas. I was. <laughs> we can always play in Texas and Florida. That's right. We should have probably done a spring break show there. I'll bet you can play in Pennsylvania. Probably. Right. I yeah, mean. Yeah. I mean. We're gonna play it. We're playing it safe, obviously. Yeah. Probably. Eight people. Are you uh, are you at liberty to talk about any of the other things that are happening? Um, well, I imagine there's new material surfacing at some point, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, uh, it's been a long time. So I hope that people can expect to hear some stuff in the near future. Yeah. That's about all I know. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and do you have a timeline for for you committing your are you actively seeking someone to to be your producer with you, these pieces of music you've been working on or are you just like yeah that needs that uh i'm not actively seeking right now but um i've spoken to a few people that um seem interesting to me to work with and it just depends on I need to look, like I said, I want to look at my, uh, what I've got right now on the table and decide if that's cohesive enough to put together so that I have something to bring to someone else. You know what I mean? Do you know who I like? Tucker. Tucker's great. Tucker's great. Tucker worked on our last record on the last oh, really? mouse record. Mm -hmm. oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. We had, a, we had a lot of folks collaborating on that record and Tucker was a big part of it. He yeah. made two or three of my favorite records of the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. What were those? They were uh, Jesse Sykes and The Sweet Hereafter. Yeah. Which I was, I was super into both of those records. Um, he made a record by a band called Sanford Arms. Okay. Um, which was uh, Ben from alcohol funny car later i i played in a band called burning rivers for a short while with him mm -hmm. but sanford arms was a great band that never really got their due mm -hmm. it's kind of like will coey but very mellow mm -hmm. without the raucous part of that post post radiohead alt country yeah yeah good. um and and i and you know he's unmatched he's matchless in that territory i think he's he's really good yeah yeah Tucker Martinez is a great producer. there's another record he made that i was i listened to the shit out of he made a long winter zp also 
Oh, nice. Yeah, I've worked with him with other artists as well, you know, coming in to collaborate, throw some strings on stuff. It's very easy to work with, makes you feel comfortable. That to me is one of the most important things is you feel comfortable yeah. right out of the gate. Uh, so you have a little recording setup. If someone wanted viola on their recording, they yeah. could get in touch with you and, and they could hire you to do that, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. I have everything here to do it. I, in fact, I did it for um, Modest Mouse stuff. Oh, you just, you just kind of like, <laughs> I don't, you don't know when or where or how or what, you know, could have been that last record or just for funsies. <laughs> no, what did I say? Modest Mouse? I no. used it. No, it was just an example to say that, yes, I could. And I said in this modest house, I do some recording. Yeah. Total modest house recordings all the time. I mean, yeah. you know got this here you know you have a name for your studio mm -mm. no i don't yeah. it's called the music room <laughs> there you go <laughs> oh, wherever <laughs> my computer it's called the champagne room oh i like that it's uh, but I, it's not glamorous, you, you know, my the furthest thing from the champagne. Room. Anybody watching, I try to get most of the room out of it. You know, like yeah. this is the this is the studio corner of the music room, which is also the kitty litter room. Same and, here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, books and an old record player that doesn't work. And <laughs> we have all the recycling that is supposed to go out <laughs> over here. Uh -huh. the mountain of all kinds of shoes yeah and then it's like you know 28 degrees outside right now Oof. So, this is a terrible room it's the worst room in the house where i'm at unfortunately but help yeah. is on the way i think oh it's good to know we found a place that's got a barn that is finished wow that is a studio really that's right Wow, that's exciting. That's really exciting. No, it's like the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. It's the thing. I like my little corner. It's quiet enough, you know. I you get as much space as you need, right? I have as much space as I need. This room is actually plenty big to record and and just work on stuff. Right now, I'm working on a little piece that I put together for a friend who's um works at an art gallery and they asked me to contribute a song. So it was fun. It was, it was a cool little endeavor, solo, just a solo endeavor. I had some friends. I had my, my boyfriend and some other friends help out with it, you know, for filming and recording. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'm working on that right now, just trying to clean up the sound, but uh, it was a fun little project to be able is to it, do. Is it finished? Um, it's finished. It's finished. It's a finished song, you know, and that it's, yeah. and it's been filmed live. So now I'm just sort of cleaning up live sound. So, yeah, it's when, a, fun, it's uh, a good exercise. When will that be viewable? Mm, it, well, you know what? It's part of a fundraiser. So I think you have to purchase the video. So if you want to support the arts, you can look up Disjecta Gallery. Yeah. D I S Jecta. And that? uh, that's their, it's like an auction uh, fundraising. It's not live streaming, but it's a streamable thing now, you know, due to, due to COVID. So. Wait a minute. Is there something going on in the world that is, is restricting people in some way? Um, I mean, I've seen people wear masks. I don't know why seems kind of weird. I don't wear one. Just <laughs> kidding. I wear masks. Please wear your mask. Yeah, wear two if you have to. Yeah, wear two masks. Wear three. Fuck it. I'm wearing don't, three. Don't be silly. Wear masks. Uh, I'm, I'm wearing masks, goggles, earplugs. <laughs> I'm wearing a, a, a stocking cap, yeah. rubber mm -hmm. stocking cap, the whole thing. Whatever you, whatever you need and what people need around you do it you know i saw that someone was wearing a they told you to wear um a uh, hosiery around your head to keep all your mask really tight around your face <laughs> really <laughs> yeah like bank robber style <laughs> really 
I read some different hacks on how to like, not too long ago, they're saying wear two masks, you know, and there's some strains that are out now that are like extremely, um, uh, they're just maybe more volatile and more lethal and easier to catch. So they were talking about wearing two masks or how to hack your mask. You don't get ear pain. And, you know, one of them was to cut some hose and just wrap that around your head with a mask underneath, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah, it's not a good look. I don't think that's for me. (laughs) I think put the mask on and just make sure you get a mask that works. You know, uh, the mask is like shoes. Like you're not going to wear, if a pair of shoes doesn't fit, you're not going to put them on and go for a walk. That's a really good point. Find a mask that works for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard. Mm -mm. And you can modify them. Mm -hmm. If you have even kindergarten level craft skills, like it's pretty, you know, it's pretty doable for most people. Yeah. Yeah. Just saying. Just do it. Did you get sick this year? No, I didn't get sick. Yeah. Um, can you hear my cat? Oh my gosh. I'm I sorry. The cat. Oh, it's fine. Yeah. I thought it was my stomach. No, it's my 17 year old cat. She's cranky. <laughs> she's not in the kitty litter room. <laughs> well, she's cranky because she's 17. Yeah, there's that. I think uh, I've gotten no, sick early in the year. I, I didn't get sick this year. I'm lo- I feel really lucky. No, nope, you know, my immediate family here you know, my household. Nope. I didn't get sick. What about the shot? Nope. Not yet. You haven't gotten it yet. No, no. Oregon's we're chugging along, you know, right. It's seems slow going, but I think they say soon it won't be, you know, there'll be a lot coming soon. So I'm confident that um, I will be at a point where I'll have been vaccinated with plenty of time to enjoy work later this year and even maybe you know some summertime activities staying hopeful you know Mm -hmm. i have my appointment next month that's great good for you yeah thanks Mm -hmm. well um i'm gonna take my little dogs out for a stroll yeah that's a great idea i already did that with this buddy i'm gonna maybe take him again I bet he'd appreciate it. You know, I'm like talking to you. I have no idea what the weather is right now. It could be sunny. It could be raining. It could be hail. You it's, know, it's it that like time of year. Here, yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> right. And Portland's just like, don't know, but don't worry. It'll. I know. It'll we rain got we got him day. a raincoat. He has a cute little fashionable raincoat. It's got like a little pop what collar. Color <laughs> what color is it? It's gray. It's gray and it's like, it looks like a cloak. He looks like Sherlock Holmes. Really? Yeah, we call him his, my dog is Sam. We call, I call him Sam Lock Holmes because when uh-huh. I put that on him, because <laughs> he's got the, the collar is kind of like high and it's like just like a cloaky kind of thing and it's waterproof and, you know, he's picky. Dogs are, or whatever, you know. Right. He doesn't like the rain, let's just say. So, I right, neither do I. Neither do I. 20 years in, I'm still, I still don't like, I don't mind it, but yeah, I like summer more. You don't say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, Take your dogs uh, out for a little uh, cold stroll. It sounds refreshing. Don't be surprised if, if uh, you get a text from me in the middle of September and I'm like, I'm coming to Vegas. I welcome it. Because... Hey. We're losing our minds, you know, we yeah. uh, like everyone, everyone wants to get out. Everyone wants to be out. And, um, uh, we have a trip planned that first week of September to go to Nashville and I'm going to play actually, which I'm really excited about. You are. Yeah. I have a show in Nashville. It's a, a party. Oh man. A friends 50th birthday party. Mm-hmm. That sounds so cool. That's great. 
Um, Nashville's hey. such a fun city. Oh yeah. And uh, when is it in September? Yeah. No, hopefully your weather will be a little cooled off by then, and or even pleasantly summery. It'll be great. Yeah, we have plans maybe to go to um, on a little road trip uh, through Utah in June. Nice. Yeah. Gosh, I mean, we are just so looking forward to it. I'm hoping that everything falls in place. We could do it safely, you know. Yes. Yeah. Come to come to Vegas. Let let me know. Excellent. Come see Please. the festival show. You're great. You are too. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate You're you bringing me on here. Uh, it's uh, you know we're just kind of we, we meander and we babble and we talk. And I ask you some questions. Occasionally, I'll interrupt you and talk about poop. <laughs> but it's true. I nervously poop before every show. Like, if you see me on a stage, I have pooped within 10 minutes of you seeing me walk on stage. And I'll leave you with there's a biological reason for that. I you think know? so. It's your vagus nerve. It's that vag the vagus nerve is the like biggest nerve in your body and it connects your brain to your whole like a uh, digestive system is that right yeah that's why like if you're scared of flying and the day you have to fly you have stomach aches or you gotta like you know or your nerves you know it's your nerves yeah it is that's why there, there's a reason for beyonce that. yes that's exactly why my vagus nerve was shook you know did you have another exploration of uh, alternative major where you learned this or did you learn this from i just learned this kind of doing my own research because i have just uh issues with like uh like uh, ibs and stuff you know i've got my own issues so you know trying to explore like how do i how do i get comfortable you know what's what foods can i eat that don't bother me and this and that you know right yeah yeah it's fascinating <laughs> <laughs> it's it really you know, is <laughs> here's the thing i laugh because i have been on a weird diet mm. because i got super fat like really fat oh and i've been on this crazy diet mm -hmm. and i always thought anti-inflammatory foods uh -huh. what a joke yeah like, no it's it's not a joke. Morning, I would wake up and I would hold the rail like an old man as I walked down the stairs. Yeah. You know, like. <gasps> yeah. I wake up in the morning now and I walk down the stairs like I'm 20. <laughs> it, it's so, a thing. It's real. Yeah. Uh, I'm the asshole. <laughs> That's the thing. I keep telling myself that, but I don't, I never believe it. Unfortunately. I, uh, you know, in another life, I probably would have been a gastroenterologist, not a rocket scientist. This stuff is fascinating to me. Uh, what, you eat and what it does to you and all that. I mean, that's not gastroenterology necessarily, but uh, the science of it is pretty cool. So take deep breaths slow even breathing to calm your vagus nerve before your next conversation that's my parting advice friend i love good advice <laughs> <laughs> uh lisa have a great night will you do me a favor mm -hmm. um are there images on your website that i can grab or do you have some high-res images that i can butcher and turn into posters for the episode probably both so uh, I can check into it and I'll let you know um, or I'll send you something. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just make it easier and send you send you whatever I can. That's as high res as I can. Oh, hello, Sammy. <laughs> and Sammy's coming in to close it out. <laughs> Are we done, bud? <laughs> All right. Have a great night. You too. Thanks again, Mike. Bye. Bye-bye.